Well, for a reason besides just being kind of upset and pissed off. Um, I mean, have you actually disagreed with the speaker? Just before, yet today. Has anyone thrown a shmoo ball? No. no. Are you serious? Not a single hand? No one's thrown a shmoo ball? Like, not out of bullshit, no. Huh. So either the speakers are that good or you're all just wusses. Um, it's too early. There was a whole, there's tracks yesterday for those that were paying attention. There was actually people speaking. Um, I even had cool swag here to give away from Security University. But I'm going to hold this now and give it away later. So I encourage you to throw a ball at these guys whenever they fuck up. Um, <laughs> Woohoo! Um, so this talk is kind of near and dear to me um, if for no other reason that I've been kind of you know, playing around with the Bluetooth stuff for a while myself. And I've kind of, um, you know, if you look back at the history of Wi Fi, and when it got real popular from a security perspective, it was when you were able to relatively rapidly, um, you know, and cheaply go and find uh, Wi-Fi networks. You know, uh, Pete Shipley did the war driving talk at DEF CON, which, you know, whatever you think of Pete, it was kind of a tipping point, I think, for the whole war driving movement, and it went from being this kind of cute thing that a few people did to mainstream media and, and whatever. Um, and Bluetooth has suffered that we haven't had the ability to get all channels on, you know, all, all the frequencies all the time and be able to intercept the traffic and figure out what's going on. Um, and I've contended that when we can do that, we can do it cheaply, that's going to be the tipping point for Bluetooth security. Um, so these guys are kind of part of that piece of the puzzle to getting an all-channel Bluetooth monitor up and running. Um, they're going to have a demo today, assuming the demo gnomes don't try to jump up and bite them too hard, because this stuff always works perfectly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Nondescript black boxes with random antennas attached to them always work every time. Um, so anyway, I'm really excited about this talk. Um, I hope you are too. Um, I do encourage you though, if you disagree with them or whatever, please throw a shmoo ball because we've got lots of swag to give away, but I'm not going to give away anymore until somebody actually throws some shit. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to these guys. Thank you very much, Bruce. We are uh, going to take about two more minutes for setup. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Um, OK, while he's setting up, I'll just introduce sort of how we sort this out. Uh, you're going to have to bear with us. We only met yesterday. Um, we've been working on the project for about three months now. Uh, it started off as a university project for me. Um, and then I generally left it alone and went and got a job and stuff. Um, and I only got back into a couple of months ago. I've been working on it since then. And that's why we haven't really tested it. <laughs> Uh, the other reason it's not up on screen yet is because things just aren't working. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, didn't didn't turn it on. Right. Okay. Um, are we almost ready? Okay. When you bring along a load of radio hardware, it takes a little longer to set up than just plugging in a laptop. Give a second. Okay. All right. All right, do we have video?
Is that really all it takes to please you guys? I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys all for coming. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as Dominic said, we just met yesterday for the first time in person. So we're excited to be here and to finally meet each other and show you some cool stuff that we've been working on. Uh, I'm Mike, and I'm here thanks to my employer, the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences. ITS is the research and engineering arm of NTIA, which is part of the United States Department of Commerce. Uh, and uh, we provide uh, telecommunication research services to various government agencies from our uh, secret lair in the foothills of Colorado, uh, also known as the Boulder Labs. We're, uh, we're right down the hall from the atomic clock. Um, I'm Dominic. I'm from the UK. I, uh, I did most of this work as an undergrad at University College in London, and now I'm a grad student at Imperial College, which is why I've got time to work on it again. And um, unfortunately, my arm's covering it, but that is me holding the registration my number of my car, which is GPL, which I was quite pleased with. But uh, anyway, there you go. And uh, hopefully this is obvious, but uh, I'm required to tell you that the United States government has no official position on anything that we have to say today. Uh, and in general, uh, you know, what, what we're showing is what has worked for us uh, your mileage may vary, it may not be the best solution for any particular problem. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, I'm not wearing these shades because I'm hiding from anybody. Uh, I wanted to clarify this because I, as I'm uh, walking around and people see me, I, I see the looks on their faces, I know what you guys are thinking. Uh, half of you are thinking, man, that guy is paranoid. And the other half are thinking, man, that guy's a jackass. <laughs> and <laughs> And uh, I, I may be both, but, uh, but uh, I have an uh, acute medical condition that causes photophobia. So these bright lights are, are you know, really fun for me right now. Uh, but alcohol helps, as I found out last night. <laughs> uh, that was a pretty good party. Everybody was there for the uh, fire alarm? Yeah. yeah, that was good fun. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was, uh, my mom called me last night to wish me luck. And uh, it was, I don't know, it was like 9 or 10 o'clock, and I'm in my room, and I'm trying to get these demos working, and my mom calls me, and, and she says, so where are you in D.C.? And I said, uh, well, I don't know, somewhere on the west side of town. She said, you know, your dad and I used to live there before you were born. I was like, oh, yeah, right. And she said, uh, and I, she said so, like, what street are you near? And I, and I just grabbed the nearest thing I found, and it was this invite to the party, and, and I said, uh, I don't know, uh, 16th Street Northwest, and she turns to, she turns to my dad and says, hey, uh, isn't 16th Street where St. Stephen's was? And I, I said, wait, St. St. Stephen's, that's where the party is. <laughs> and, she, and, and she says, uh, she says, oh, yeah, really? And I said, well, is it defunct now or something? Because there's like this hacker space there, and they invited like a thousand hackers with free booze. And, and she says, oh, no, that sounds like St. Stephen's. <laughs> 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 she, she said, we had Gloria Steinem give a, certain, a sermon on Father's Day. <laughs> They're pretty progressive. So anyway, you guys are all here for the same reason that Dominic and I are here. Sniffing Bluetooth is hard. Uh, and also, before I get started, I want to say thank you to everybody for having us here. And on behalf of both of us, I think I'd like to say that we are terrified. Um, but uh, sniffing Bluetooth is really hard. As, uh, as Bruce pointed out, we just don't have an off-the-shelf solution that is equivalent to a monitor mode for 802.11. Uh, Bluetooth, as I'm sure you all know, is a personal area networking technology that operates at the 2.4 gigahertz band, and it is a frequency hopping system. And the frequency hopping is one of the principal difficulties in building a monitor. Bluetooth hops across 79 megahertz of spectrum, pretty much the entire 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. Um, and uh, it's split into 79 channels, each one megahertz wide, all adjacent to each other in this big ch 79 megahertz chunk. And just to put it in perspective, a, uh, a, a Wi-Fi network running on 802.11b or g uh, takes up 20 megahertz, and that's considered spread spectrum, okay? So this is four times as wide as that. And uh, so a radio receiver that can receive uh, um, uh, an 802.11 signal probably can't receive an, a, a Bluetooth uh, signal ac across all the Bluetooth channels. 
Um, so, uh, and, and these little uh, tiny Bluetooth devices, the various things we have up here today, uh, these things have little one megahertz wide receivers that have a front end that's able to hop uh, very quickly uh, between these different channels. It hops 1600 times per second. Okay, so every 625 microseconds, there's a new, uh, there's a new frequency selected by a particular PicoNet. And a PicoNet is just a name for a network of two or more Bluetooth devices. Uh, and um, every Bluetooth device has a clock, and it's just a counter that increments 3,200 uh, 3, times per second. The hops happen every other clock cycle of the master device. There is, uh, every device has a clock, but the master dictates the clock for the whole PicoNet uh, for protocol purposes. Also, the uh, BD80DR, the Bluetooth, Bluetooth device address, is something else that every Bluetooth device has. It's a MAC address, and uh, it, uh, it's comprised of 48 bits, just like uh, an Ethernet MAC address, and uh, the, it, it's split into three parts. The non-significant address part, the upper address part, and the lower address part. Strangely enough, the non-significant address part is the most significant bits, uh, but it's non-significant in that uh, we don't really care about it for most of the stuff that we're, we're doing. Uh, we're going to show you some things that require, the LA require knowledge of your target networks, LAP and UAP, but do not require knowledge of the NAP. Um, but the NAP and the UAP together are the company ID, uh, which you're familiar with from other protocols. So when I was trying to identify a, a method for, for sniffing Bluetooth, uh, three bits of hardware came up. Uh, one was Project Analyzer, um, generic one made by any company, no specific one um, at all. Bluetooth OEM chips, again, not a specific company based out of Cambridge. <laughs> and the USRP, which uh, is from SS Research, although I'm sure you could use another wideband receiver. And um, obviously, very in price. Uh, the goal was always to use the, the OEM hardware because it's cheap. It's built into everything. They sell those chips by the bucket. There are just so many of them. Um, and I'll, I'll give a brief description in a minute of why that's not quite possible. Um, but first. Protocol Analyzer, all right, these are great. They're the, uh, basically the company uh, that makes the one that's, that's been talked about before is Frontline Test Equipment. And what it's designed to do is help you debug your kit. So if you're developing a Bluetooth device, you uh, tell it the MAC address of your device and it sniffs that, sniff that Pico net, but you give it that information, you give it a discoverable network and it goes out and finds that. And for debugging network, it's a fantastic bit of software. It's also very expensive. And if you've got a license for it, then you've paid a lot of money and it's not going to sniff all channels. Uh, if you haven't got a license, it's going to be illegal. So you probably don't want to be doing that. Having said that, sniffing Bluetooth is probably illegal in a lot of situations. Um, but we can't just go out and listen to any network we want. We need to know information about the network and it needs to be discoverable first. So discoverable mode kind of beats that. The OEM hardware. Now, um, after DEF CON 15, Renderman spoke about um, the fact that USRP was expensive and said, go and look at CSR, so I did. And uh, a couple of guys looked into it uh, who are much better with firmware than I am uh, and have managed to get arbitrary code running on the dongles. They can, um, they can even run them on the non-flashable, the ROM dongles by smashing the stack on it. Um, and it's great, but we've discovered that you can't sniff arbitrary channels. You need to give it a MAC address beforehand. Um, I Identifying other and discovering other devices around you works in a, a separate way, and I'm not going to go into that because it's boring. But um, if you've got the MAC address of a device, you can go out and find it with a um, with a, a, a CSR dongle. And it might be a case that, and Josh Wright has shown this in the past, that you can use that to mount an attack, but you're going to have to bootstrap it and somehow find that MAC address and maybe even find the uh, clock, the current clock signal, which I'll come on to in a minute, uh, because so much of that's implemented in hardware. Um, and you, the firmware just can't access the registers that you need to, uh, can't access the, the bits of the firmware, the, sorry, the bits of the chip that you need to, uh, to be able to just arbitrarily sniff. So we come to the SRP and I looked at it and I said, wow, that's expensive, that's cool, I want to have one of those. Um, and there are two models now, the SRP2 came out last year, I think, um, so since I did the original work and it's helped us actually get a lot further with it. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it's uh, these two boxes, the USRP and the USRP2, um, varying bandwidth. Um, 
one's a USB 2 device and the other's a, a gigabit Ethernet device. And they are just very big, expensive um, analog to digital converters. And then you do everything else you want to do in software or on an FPGA. So uh, filters, uh, various signal processing, uh, squelch control, demodulation, it's all done in software. Um, so this kind of gives us a lot more flexibility, which is what we wanted to do. So I started off trying to sniff a single channel. And uh, thankfully, I managed to use a, one of the dongles in a debug mode. So I got it to spit out data on a single channel constantly and was able to sniff that. Um, this slide, uh, I'm quite passionate about the slide because it represents about four months of my life. Um, <laughs> that is a Bluetooth packet when I finally found it. I spent a whole week looking at my CPU clock, which happened to be a 2.4 gigahertz system, uh, and going, how do I demodulate this? How do I find the packet data? And um, it was a while before I sort of went online and people were like, hey, have you realized you're sniffing your CPU clock? And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I probably should check that first. Uh, so, so this is this is a, a packet. Um, we got it. It's a, it's a um, set of complex uh, f uh, floating point numbers in a file, basically. And then we just pass those through a demodulator, and we get data out. And look, we get a packet. Uh, so, quick, quick lesson on the packet format. Access code is based off that lower address part where uh, Michael was talking about earlier. Uh, it's an error correction code. So, you've got a 24-bit lower address uh, part, and you get a 72-bit access code so we can know that we found a, a packet. Uh, the header is, is actually 18 bits and then uh, some error correction brings it up to 54 bits and then you've got a big payload on the back. Um, so what we can do is we can just receive these packets. We can find the packets in the air in this, this stream of demodulated data, um, find the lower address part, run the error correction code and if it matches the access code then we know we found the start of the packet. It's pretty much how the devices themselves do it. So I'm going to give a first demo a go. Um, right. Did the right switch. Right. So all we're going to do is um, I'll give a quick description. There are a couple of demos, and we have tried them, and I'd say most of them work. Um, most of them worked last night in a hotel room where there weren't many Wi-Fi devices and other people and playing with laptops and things like that. So we're going to try them. We do have, uh, we can run them from file rather than running them from the hardware, but that's a lot more uh, boring. So we're going to try a live demo. Don't get synced to your phone. Can you? No, this thing's you last connection. You we switch. can always you use the keyboard. Okay. The so hopefully, there we go. Uh, All right. <laughs> so what you're seeing on screen, is, what you're seeing on screen is uh, the lower address part of our keyboard and of the phone, actually. They're both cropping up. And it just tells you which time slot it's in. We're working on a single channel, like one megahertz of one of these 79 channels. Um, I just saw a smooth ball roll over there with someone just really bad at throwing it, or <laughs> just didn't think it was quite worth throwing it at us, but we probably deserve to be hit. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so there we go. We found packets. Now we have to do something with them. So the next bit is finding the next bit of this MAC address. Um, and that's not simple. We don't just get it in plain text in the packet. What it's uh, used for is. Um, initializing the uh, registers to produce the error checks. Now, there are two error checks in mm, some packets and only one in others, but the header has an error check and the, there's a CRC on the, uh, on the payload. Uh, so hopefully we should be able to just run these uh, error check algorithms in reverse and get out the initial, um, initial uh, register, which will be this upper address part. So it's a little more complicated than that. Um, Bluetooth does this uh, data whitening thing that uh, uses part of the current clock value to scramble the data. It, I think we read in the spec the other day, it does claim it's for robustness and a little bit of security. Um, whether or not that's true is, is another matter. Uh, and then we've got the forward error correction, which we, is easy to get rid of. So all we have to do is try and run this in reverse. But as we don't know this clock value, and we've got six bits, we decided to brute force it. So we get 64 candidate packets, and we get 64 upper address parts. And due to a, um, OK. Due to a, uh, a little problem with the, um, uh, the way the header error check interacts with the whitening, uh, you get these 64, and then it's the same 64 UAPs for every packet. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can't just take packet after packet and hope that the, uh, the only one that finishes up after like five packets is the one you've got. So we do this kind of sanity check, and we match it with the CRC, and hopefully that works. But if you've got audio data, you don't have a checksum. Uh, so we do some, some interesting stuff to do with timing which may or may not work. So, 
CRC demo. Yeah. So hopefully it should Did find one? and there we go. Found a CRC with 14 packets, which is one channel. Um, 14 packets, we got the data out. Of course, if you buffer all 14 packets, you can go back and decode them and get the data out. Um, and then hopefully this will work with a phone. So it's about four grand. Very far, yeah. Okay. So what this is doing is it takes each there we go. That was even quicker, which is not meant to be. Um, <laughs> in fact, that is the first time it's ever been quicker to use that method. Um, so there you go. That, what that does is it takes the uh, relative time of all these, these sort of the clock value versus the upper address part, and then times the distance between the gaps between packets, and gives us, uh, you look for the right progression, and uh, apparently got it in 13 packets, which is fantastic. So what can we do with this stuff? Well, now we've got it, we can uh, work out the clock value for every packet. So rather than brute forcing the clock value to work out the UOP, now we've got the UOP, we brute force the clock value until we get the right one out. Um, we can find the packets in the air, and we can unwhiten the payload and look at the data. And if we've got a checksum, we can verify it so we know whether the data is correct or anything. So we're in a pretty good state to start sniffing, sniffing data, apart from we're only doing it on a single channel, and these things hop around multiple channels. Um, so. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'd love to. All right, so we have the ability to find the LAP, we have the ability to find the UAP, and using that information, we can decode packets on a single channel. But uh, how do we get to all 79? If we're sitting on a single channel, uh, we only see 1 79th of the traffic, and that uh, could give us some interesting information, but it's not really what we want, right? Right. So uh, the most straightforward approach is just to run the thing 79 times, right? Uh, the USRP, this black box over here, can give us eight megahertz of bandwidth at a time. The USRP2 can give us 25 megahertz of bandwidth at a time. Um, so w it's giving us more channels than we're decoding, right? We're, it's giving us eight or 25 and we're only decoding one of them. Well, we could, in software, demultiplex that, that raw waveform uh, by uh, running it through a, a digital down conversion multiple times and selecting a different frequency out of that band each time and then running uh, you know multiple instances of the decoder and that's that's one thing that we've tried how many channels can we get using this technique well like I mentioned the USRP can get us eight the USRP2 can get us 25 but that's still uh, you know not quite a third of the uh, Bluetooth band but let me give you a, a, a demonstration of this technique. Um, I'm going to start a, a call on the cell phone so that uh, we get a lot of packets going by. And um, in this demo, we are decoding packets from two different channels. And you can see got packet on 500,000 and negative 500,000. And that's 500 kilohertz above our center frequency and 500 kilohertz below our center frequency. So it's two adjacent Bluetooth channels. And as you can see, we're getting packets on both and I'm seeing the LAPs of both, uh, both Pico nets that we have up here. Now I'm gonna try it again uh, with uh, eight channels, all delivered by the USRP. And you can see we're getting ch a lot more channels. Um, but you can also see at the beginning of some of the lines this UO, UO, UO getting spewed out there before it says got packet. You guys see that? That, those are USRP overruns. What's happening is I'm not keeping up with the bits that are uh, being sent to my host computer by the USRP. So I'm not able to completely decode all eight of these channels because I'm not fast enough here. My computer isn't fast enough to do it. Can we do all 79 channels with this technique? Well, we probably can, but it would take 10 USRPs uh, or four USRP2s. So if you have a pile of these things and uh, a lot of resources at your disposal, uh, this might be something you wanna try. Uh, it certainly is the only way that we know of to capture every packet on every PicoNet in your area. Um, but the CPU requirements are considerable. We can decode, roughly speaking, with our software, about one channel per CPU core, okay? So this laptop has two cores. It's able to decode two channels, but as you saw, it failed to decode eight. 
okay? Uh, and uh, y if you were to build a, a 79 core system with four USRP2s, uh, you would also really have to pay attention to uh, bus speeds and storage speeds and so forth. Um, it's theoretically possible, but it's expensive and certainly not portable. Back actually before the uh, USRP2 was released, I did try and convince a university in the UK to pay for me to build an 8 USRP box. <laughs> um, and one of the things we looked at, uh, actually they had a whole stack of them, but it came up against this, you can only attach four of them to a system, so, uh, sorry, 10 USRP box. We need three systems running and then we need to like, this whole multi-core on each and then multi-processing and parallel message passing and stuff. And actually it just became way too boring and removed from Bluetooth to really be interesting, and it was going to cost an absolute fortune. Um, so they said no. Um, <laughs> so we moved on to trying to predict the hopping pattern. Um, now, there are a number of reasons. Um, obviously, we can't sniff the whole spectrum. Um, so if we can predict the hopping pattern ahead of time, um, then we don't need to build one of these sort of massive systems. Uh, we can try and hop with the, hop with the uh, communication and, and sniff it. Um, if you want to actively attack anything, you need to know which channel you're transmitting on at any time. Um, and you need to be able to know which channel you're on. You need to be able to whiten the packet. So um, we did try active attacks without, without hopping, and it, it just doesn't work. And as it says up there, it's fun. Um, that's, fun's a relative term. <laughs> um, it seemed like a challenge, and it seemed like it was going to be a, something interesting to do. But uh, fun's probably not the right word. So it, this hopping sequence is it's descri described beautifully in the Bluetooth spec. Uh, go and look at it if you want. Um, it's about four pages long. Um, and it takes input of the current clock time, um, so 27-bit clock, um, and the upper address part and the lower address part of the, of the device, which we've already shown you can derive. Um, and then it hops around. Uh, and it's, it's actually not quite. I mean, it's pseudo-random, obviously, but it's, um, it's quite regular as it hops in a small area and then shifts and things like that, so there are some little games we can play with that. Um, but in general, it will hop all over the place. Uh, so the best thing to do is to uh, take the information we got and just generate the whole thing. And on a um, standard system, it takes, what, a couple of seconds to just generate the all uh, 24 hours of hopping pattern. Uh, and then we use the information we've got, especially those last uh, six bits that we got from the whitening, to find out where in that hopping pattern we are. And we put the packets together, and we find our place in this pattern. And um, then we follow it from there. So let's uh, give it a go, hopefully. This is the demo that failed repeatedly yesterday. <laughs> so be prepared to arm yourselves. The, the demo. None of the other demos failed, I'm sure. No, no. <laughs> OK, so we initiate call on the. Oh, oh, there we go. First <laughs> time. First time. Okay, and, and if you see, we our clock value is currently that. Uh, and I'm going to... Oh, I'm going to kick myself this failed. Going to run it again and just show that it does increase. And there you go. Um, and so that's gone up by roughly the right amount. You feel free to work that out in your own time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we've retrieved the, the clock from there. Um, is there a second clock demo? What's that? Is there a second clock demo or no? Uh, no, it's just you, isn't it? No. Okay. So let's give it a go. Okay, so by, it, by being able to predict the hop pattern, uh, it gives us the ability to only have to decode one channel at a time, which we can do on the laptop, or, or, right? So uh, that's, that's one of the problems that needs to be solved in order to build a, an all-channel monitor. Um, and uh, uh, one approach that you might think then, well, uh, it would be, well, okay, now that we know the hopping pattern, let's just retune the front end uh, daughter board uh, on our uh, USRP, right? And just retune it 1,600 times per second, or every 625 microseconds. Well, it turns out that uh, the daughter board uh, takes about 200 or so microseconds to tune. So uh, that doesn't work. Um, and uh, so we, we, uh, we were looking around for other solutions and uh, kind of stumbled upon one. Um, and um, I'm going to describe it here uh, for how we can actually 
uh, hop between all these 79 channels uh, with only one of these USRP 2s here uh, instead of having to have several devices. Um, how many of you guys are uh, digital signal processing professionals or otherwise skilled in the art? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, so those 10 people uh, saw this slide and said, oh, that's how they do it. Uh, so for the rest of you, uh, assuming that you want to know how it works, uh, I'm going to uh, take the risk of boring you with some uh, digital signal processing theory for a few minutes here. Uh, the technique that we use to get all 79 channels uh, with one device decoded by our host PC is intentional aliasing. And it's kind of a trick that we're using. Um, one of the fundamentals of digital signal processing is the process of digital sampling. If you have an analog signal, like say this blue line uh, represents, and you uh, want to turn it into a digital signal, you run, it, you run it through an analog to digital converter or a sampler. And what that sampler does is it just measures the value of something, some continuously varying thing over time, right? So if you have this blue uh, analog signal and you uh, measure its value at successive points in time, you might end up with something like that series of red dots. Are those actually red on screen? Anyway, uh, th those red dots that have legs. Uh, those things are red, trust me. And uh, uh, in this case, what this uh, picture represents is a sine wave with a frequency of 3 megahertz being sampled at a rate of 8 mega samples per second. So an 8 megahertz sampler uh, measuring a 3 megahertz sine wave. And this particular sequence of red dots then is our digital signal. And this particular sequence happens to repeat every eight samples, as you can see. As you can see, and it uh, this particular sequence can be thought to be a digital representation of an analog three megahertz sine wave. Now, if we take our same eight mega sample per second sampler and sample a different uh, s analog signal, one let's say we have a sine wave of five megahertz. So here, this green dashed line is a five megahertz sine wave, and we sample it with our digital sampler, and we get this series of red dots uh, that can be thought of as a digital representation of a five megahertz signal. So it's uh, uh, if we were to s get a, a different frequency sine wave, say 5.2 megahertz, we'd get a different sequence of red dots than we get here, right? But this particular sequence might look familiar to you. It is the exact same sequence that represented a three megahertz sine wave because these two sine waves happen to intersect at each of our sample points, right? So if we get this particular sequence of red dots, how do we know whether the signal was at three megahertz or five megahertz? We can't. In the digital domain, the frequency is ambiguous. Uh, it's not completely ambiguous. We can tell a difference between, say, a 3 megahertz and a 3.2 megahertz signal, but we can't tell the difference between 3 and 5. And the reason we can't tell the difference is because they in happen to intersect at our, uh, at our sample rate. Um, and it's not just these two waveforms. There are also, uh, and these things are called aliases of each other. These particular frequencies also have aliases at higher, uh, at higher frequencies, like 11 megahertz, like 13 megahertz, 19 megahertz, 21 megahertz. I could go on and on and on. The list is infinite, right? Uh, but all of, all of these aliases are related to each other. They all happen to be 3 megahertz away from an integer multiple of our sample rate. 3 is 3 above 0, 5 is 3 below 8, 11 is 3 above 8, and so forth. So we, n we can predict, uh, we know exactly which, which aliases we might get on any particular frequency. And we only get a four megahertz swap of non-aliased stuff from zero to four megahertz, for example. So um, this is generally a considered a problem to be avoided. Uh, because if you, let's say you're building a radio receiver and you want to pick up a three megahertz signal, well, you don't want some neighboring five megahertz signal 
to interfere with your three megahertz signal in the digital domain, right? They don't interfere with each other in the analog domain, but as soon as you digitize them, they do interfere with each other. And you get an infinite number of aliases all interfering with the signal that you want. So what we do is typically is to build a filter in the analog domain. So this picture shows a uh, uh, rudimentary anti-aliasing filter. We have a receive antenna hooked up to an analog circuit that includes a low pass filter. And then that low pass filter only passes lower frequencies on to the analog to digital converter. So it's passing along only the three megahertz signal and rejecting five megahertz and 11 megahertz signals. And this allows our, uh, this allows us to decode stuff uh, that might be operating at three megahertz and avoid stuff, uh, avoid aliases from five megahertz, 11 megahertz, and so forth. There's another somewhat common approach. Uh, instead of using a low pass filter, we could use a band pass filter, a filter that allows some frequencies um, in the middle uh, while rejecting frequencies that are both lower and higher the pass band. And so we could use our same eight megahertz sampler, our same uh, eight mega sample per second sampler uh, with a band pass filter that allows stuff around five megahertz but rejects stuff around three and 11. So we remove the possibility of aliases and we're able to use, just by using a different filter on the front end, we're able to select the five megahertz neighborhood rather than selecting the three megahertz neighborhood. But we don't have to change anything uh, as far as the sample rate or anything in the digital domain. All we have to do is change the filter. Bluetooth is a frequency hopping system, and this is a spectrogram that, this is actual, an actual spectrogram of uh, Bluetooth, although some of the subsequent slides are doctored a bit. Um, this, each of these little bursts is a Bluetooth packet. And as you can see, as time progresses downward, the packets appear on different channels. And this particular uh, spectrogram is eight megahertz wide. So, um, uh, let's say for, uh, for the sake of argument that we have um, a Bluetooth system that only uh, has eight channels instead of 79 channels. Now let's say it operates at a really low frequency. It operates from zero to eight megahertz instead of operating at 2.4 gigahertz. Well, then this, this spectrogram could represent the, uh, all the packets uh, being transmitted by that PICO net for a short period of time. Um, if we were to sample this particular PICO net with our eight mega sample per second sampler, we would get aliases. Remember three and five would look like each other four, uh, well, I should say three megahertz and five megahertz. In this case, channels four and five would look like each other. Channels one and eight would look like each other. We get a, a spectrogram that looks like this. Notice, I'll, I'll go back and forth a couple times. Notice that the packet that originally, or in the analog domain, was on channel eight, now appears on both channels one and eight. All channels that were on either of those now appear on both in the digital domain because we're using an eight mega sample per second sampler, which isn't high enough in order to avoid this aliasing. Well, this would be really bad if there were packets transmitted on both channels one and eight at the same time. But <laughs> Bluetooth is a frequency hopping system. A particular Pico net only transmits on one frequency at a time. So we don't have this problem as long as there's only one Pico net that we're trying to monitor. Uh, we can use this trick by intentionally introducing aliases to get more channels decoded with less hardware because we're getting all these channels layered on top of each other. And in the digital domain, we can't tell them apart. They look completely equivalent, but they won't, uh, they won't interfere with each other as long as they're not transmitting at the same time, which they shouldn't be. We could take this a step further and uh, cut our sample rate in half and introduce even more aliases. So imagine uh, folding a piece of paper in half and then folding it over again. Uh, channels one, four, five, and eight would be layered on top of each other, and channels two, three, six, and seven would be aliased on top of each other. And um, uh, we could even go take another step further, cut it in half again, and get all eight channels aliased on, on a single channel. But we don't do that. And the reason we don't do that is because there are good things and there are bad things about using this aliasing trick. Uh, the good thing is that we get more channels, 
right? The bad thing is that we get more noise, and the really ugly thing is that we get more interference, okay? Any interferer operating on one of several channels that are aliased on top of each other now obliterates all the channels that we are seeing at that particular alias. So say, for example, you have a narrow band interferer, uh, like that vertical red line operating on channel eight. Maybe it's your CPU clock or something. And uh, <laughs> uh, if, you, uh, if you use the aliasing trick or in the particular way I just described, well, now that obliterates everything on both channels one and eight, okay? This is exactly the kind of problem that frequency hopping is intended to avoid, right? Uh, so we need to use this technique sparingly uh, because we don't want to, to have all this interference and we might have some broadband interference like that's probably an 802.11 uh, frame of some kind, that uh, big wide band there. So what we do is we use a USRP2. This one up here has been modified in a couple ways. We have uh, th this is a, a simplified block diagram here. The receive antenna is connected to the RFX 2400 daughter board. And that's uh, one of the daughter boards that, that's sold with, with this device uh, that happens to be a transceiver at the 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, this daughter board includes an ISM band pass filter. It's a special purpose filter uh, that is a, b a band pass for the entire ISM band. A lot of people actually disable that filter. They cut the traces to it so that they can operate outside of the ISM band. We don't. We leave that ISM filter intact. Uh, then the, uh, the RFX 2400 uh, converts the signal down to baseband and then runs it through a low-pass anti-aliasing filter. Well, we remove the low-pass anti-aliasing filter. And this happens to be an off-chip analog circuit, so it's pretty straightforward to bypass. Uh, with a little soldering. Then the, uh, the signal passes from the RFX 2400 to uh, an ADC uh, sampler on the uh, USRP2 motherboard. And this, uh, uh, th this digital signal then is processed by an FPGA on the motherboard. The reason for this, uh, or one of the reasons for this, is that uh, the, the sample rate of the ADC is faster than the bit rate that we can get across this gigabit ethernet bus going to the computer. So the FPGA has to downsample. And when you downsample, when you start throwing samples aside, you have, the, you have the possibility of introducing more aliases. So there's a digital anti-aliasing filter there. So we've had to modify the FPGA code uh, to disable the anti-aliasing filter on the USRP2's FPGA. So by disabling both anti-aliasing filters, we get all frequencies uh, in the ISM band. We're still limited by the ISM filter, which is great because Bluetooth happens to use almost the entire ISM band. So we're getting all the aliases we want and really no aliases that we don't want. And now I'm gonna give you a demonstration and this is, uh, we were just, just getting this working yesterday for the first time. By the way, uh, Dominic mentioned we, we've only been working together for a couple months, and uh, this is the first time we met in person. But uh, um, when I first suggested, hey, maybe we should go to SmooCon and, and like do a Friday talk, uh, just a little uh, work in progress, show them what we're working on. And he said, oh, why don't maybe we should do a, a whole hour. And I thought, ah, there's no way we're going to have enough stuff for a whole hour. I had no idea we'd get as far as we did. <laughs> so we're pretty excited about this stuff. We hope you are too. Uh, I'm going to initiate a call on the, on the cell phone here, just uh, generate some traffic. And what this demo is going to do, if it works, uh, is first of all, it's going to recover the UAP and then recover the clock, just like Dominic demoed earlier. But once it has the clock, then it's going to follow the hopping sequence and decode frames on the actual channels where they belong, uh, one at a time across all 79 channels. That's it, that's a theory anyway, let's see what happens. Ooh. It helps if you use the right script. Okay, are we actually detecting any packets? We had an overrun. 
Hmm. Let's try it with a different squelch setting. This is a... Uh, very scientific process. Exactly. I'm not actually sure we're getting any data from the USRP tube here. Let's see. I'm going to give a, uh, uh, a little go. Uh, uh, just give a uh, little FFT here and see if we're actually getting any. OK, we are getting some signal from our USRP. And this is actually aliased. Um, so we're seeing right now a 25 megahertz wide swath of spectrums uh, centered at 2.44 gigahertz, uh, only it's aliased. So we're seeing uh, you know, multiple 25 megahertz bands all kind of layered on top of each other. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh, that looks good. And I'll give this one more try, and if this doesn't work, then uh, we'll resort to using the uh, um, the saved uh, waveform that we have in a file. Oh, it helps if you actually use the right program when you when you click through your uh, command line history. Eh? See what happens here. Of course, my Bluetooth uh, my phone call is probably ended. Is that, did you get my call? Okay. All right, no luck. We're going to use the, uh, the saved file that we have. And so this is kind of cheating, but we've saved a, a waveform to disk uh, that is just the raw bits that have come out of the USRP2. And this is one of the waveforms that we've been using in our development. So I'm just going to run it through uh, as if it were the bits that I were getting in real time. And as you can see, it gets the, the UAP. And it may have to try a couple times to get the clock. It's somewhat of an error-prone error prone process. Uh, and every time we fail to get the clock, we just start over completely and throw out the UAP that we got, because who knows, maybe it was wrong. And there we go. Well, uh, we've acquired lock on a signal. And, uh, and uh, well, we've acquired the clock. And now we're going through every individual channel through at every time slot and looking for the packet that should be there. Uh, and in many cases, we're finding them. And as you can see, most of them are HV3 packets, which are uh, a type of voice data, because so, this was this actual headset and mobile phone uh, that we were using for the demo here. Um, and uh, as you can see, we're getting a lot more packets a lot faster and on a lot more channels. I'll just pause it here, and you can see the range of channels that we're getting. Yay. Um, the, uh, and actually, what you're seeing right now is not as fast as it would have been if the live demo worked, uh, because right now I am limited by the speed of the hard disk in this laptop. That was actually the limiting factor in that particular in that particular uh, case. Okay, we added this slide yesterday, so I just need a chance to read it. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, pretty much. What does this do? Okay, we haven't. We haven't gone and invented promiscuous mode for Bluetooth, but we're really, really close. Um, you can do it for, for one PicoNet, one connection. Um, if that demo worked live, then that's what we would have been doing. We'd been grabbing every packet from that conversation. Um, and we could have just taken the data from those and tried to reassemble the, the um, voice uh, from the call. Uh, and the only security on most of these devices comes from the pin which is like a four digit pin, so not only can you brute force that, but there was some attack that cracked it. Uh, I can't remember the guy's names, two guys working out in Israel a couple of years ago, um, cracked it. Uh, one's called Wool, and I can't remember the other guy's name. Um, but uh, they, uh, yeah, so they cracked that. Um, the other thing that shows us is, uh, I mean, just out of interest, has anyone ever been told, oh, put your Bluetooth device in like non-discoverable mode to um, hide it so there's no, you know, so no one can, can hack into your device? I mean, that gets, that, well, I've certainly heard that piece of advice, and it just doesn't matter. Um, and one of the other things that happens that we found quite often with these is even if you're not making a call, even if you not, don't think you're transmitting, the two devices just handshake backwards and forwards all the time. They send these little null and pull packets back, to them back and forth. So anyone can just pick that stuff up 
and, and get in there and, and play with your device if they need to. Um, uh, is there anything else? Does any other security everyone's okay? No, I think that's it. Uh, a couple of people have worked on this before. Uh, one of them is Josh Wright. And um, one of the things he did was use this, this code and then go out and find that NAP section, which we weren't interested in. Um, and he used the sort of standard OUI list and he built his own database from it and sort of got people to register their Bluetooth devices. And he used this to get a standard $10 dongle and impersonate a device and listen in on phone calls and such like. Uh, and all he did is use one of these devices to just bootstrap it. So um, while earlier on I had said that, you know, the little USB dongles, they're never going to be able to do all this stuff we want to do. You're never going to be useful. We're going to have to use this hardware. This bootstraps it, but you can use like an attack from a small dongle. So, you know, I could sniff um, people's MAC addresses now, work them all out, and then later on this afternoon I could use my laptop and a dongle to just listen in on everyone's traffic if I wanted to. So this is only needed sort of the beginning. Um, all right. Quick bit of Q&A first before I sort of open for questions. The, um, is that the address? Okay. Um, the project is up on SourceForge and uh, that is the web address. I go to it from a completely different URL, <laughs> but apparently they both work. Yeah, that's sure, it fits on the slide, that's fine. Um, uh, now, most of what we've shown you obviously operates one of these boxes. Uh, I think the, the, little, the black box is about $700 and this about $1,400 if you can get them. And I know they're all sold out and they're not making another batch yet. Um, but what we've done is uh, on the site there are some captured waveforms. Uh, we have a few of them kicking around. We have like about 10 DVDs uh, with, with captured waveforms and the software on it. So you can play with it. Um, you can have a look at it, do whatever you want with it. Uh, you can use these samples to download them from the website, so you don't need the hardware. You can tinker with it on your own box. Um, and they, some of them are from audio calls. Uh, we also have a Wireshark interface for it, so it actually does dump the um, stuff through to Wireshark. Wireshark does not recognize it as Bluetooth traffic yet. Uh, that's something I should have been working on, but I haven't got around to it. Uh, I have one of those degree things to work out. Um, so sometime soon, uh, I'm sure that'll be working. But if anyone wants to get involved, you can grab the code from there, or you can come and see us afterwards, and we'll give you the code and some samples on a memory stick or on DVD or whatever. So, are there any questions? Okay, okay. Your hand went up first. Uh, did you get that? So the um, the question was: Is the problem with something at high frequency? just the sheer amount of data that you get. Uh, that uh, that's part of the problem, uh, that or that can be a problem, although in general the, the data rate has more to do with the width, the bandwidth of a signal, and not the actual frequency that it's operating on. I think uh, this might be a good offline question. Can I? Can you find me later? Thank you. Go for it. If you guys are pre-calculating the time ahead, 24 hours, uh, does that open it up for packet injection uh, for a, an attack? Uh, you know, you, you pick a 10-second time frame that you inject, you know, a, another character in a US or a wireless keyboard during yeah, the time so frame. So um, that was one of the reasons we decided to actually uh, try and calculate this Hoffman pattern uh, rather than just, and one of the options was to just alias the signal over itself on this USLP2, um, but it's uh, one of the advantages of, of the Hoffman pattern is that if you know it, you can go and perform active attacks and you can inject. We haven't written any transmit code yet. Um, we're mostly concentrating on trying to get this stuff working. Um, I'd say the majority of this was written in the past week or two. So it's, yeah, we haven't got around to it, that's all. Yeah, but that is definitely, that's a good question. It's definitely true. You, it, it, reversing the hopping sequence and uh, determining both the UAP and the clock are uh, certainly a prerequisite for any active attack, pretty much. Question right here. Could you explain how you get the full clock value again? Um, how do we get the full clock value? Okay, what we do is the, the clock um, value uh, cycles every roughly 24 hours. Um, and the hopping pattern is, is based on that, and it only repeats after 24 hours. Um, and so what we do is we, we take the data we've got and the, the gaps between the packets. Um, so if we've received two packets on the same frequency, there we know the kind of number of time slots there are between those. Uh, and we also know 
the lower six bits of the clock that we got from reversing that whitening. And we use that to find our position within the, uh, within the sequence. So we generate this like 24 hour sequence in memory and then just kind of move along it until we find a match uh, or a unique match of where we are. And then we assume that's the, the clock and then we can verify it with the next packet or so on and so forth. So, yep, okay. Um, Scanners, or are they too uh, slow and sloppy for on the front ends? I have no idea what they are. Because uh, availability on those is uh, is pretty significant. That's a good point. Mm. My guess is that there are if their front ends don't tune fast enough, uh, but I haven't tested them. Uh, however, the, one of the big problems you're going to have is that even if they do tune fast enough, it, it you have a, a one megahertz wide channel. And an off-the-shelf scanner that's designed for, for picking up like uh, police radios and stuff like that is dealing is generally dealing with channels that are in the neighborhood of 25 kilohertz. So you can fit a lot of 25 kilohertz channels into a one megahertz wide channel. Uh, that 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 radio might not even have the capability of, of receiving that much bandwidth. Uh, but it's certainly something to look into. Uh, like we said, this isn't the only way to do it. This is just how we've done it. And there are probably more affordable ways in the future, like maybe hacking the front end out of an off-the-shelf Bluetooth device and attaching it to some other kind of digitizer or something like that. Uh, sky's the limit. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Uh, I uh, might depending on uh, how that works. Uh, but, uh, and Dominic might talk to us later. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, how hard would it be to do the demodulation and say that FPGA you're passing things through instead of a dedicated? That's uh, a really CPU? good question. And the USRP2 uh, FPGA I mentioned uh, uh, has to downsample to get, uh, to fit the, the bits over the ethernet. So it would be really nice if we could actually implement our demodulator in the FPGA because it actually sees 100 megahertz of bandwidth in the FPGA without any aliasing trick. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it would be really cool to implement at least the hopping uh, algorithm in the FPGA and somehow synchronize it. Uh, we, in fact, we were talking about heading in that direction uh, until the aliasing trip uh, presented itself and uh, gave us a, you know, a, a quicker, easier option. Uh, but that's something that would be really cool to do and we would love to uh, work on that or, or see other people work on it. Yeah. I, would, I would say actually one of the reasons we didn't do that is because neither of us know that much about FPGA programming. Oh yeah. We didn't want to get involved in that <laughs> until and, like, like and waste our time on that if we weren't sure whether it worked. Yeah, so if anyone is interested in getting involved with the project or, or FPGA programming especially, uh, get in touch because we would really love to do that. I think we have one more question. Somebody's been waiting here. Yeah, just, just wondering um, if um, using 79 USB dongles um, is something you looked at as well just to capture the, the packets on each. And if, if so, what are the Sem issues with that? 79 dongles is a good idea, but uh, with the do all the dongles that we're familiar with, uh, you still have to have prior knowledge of the address of the device of the target network. Uh, so you'd need 79 dongles and you would need uh, knowledge of the address and the only way we have to get that right now is this, to bootstrap that process. Uh, thank you all. We're going to be outside uh, after we pack up all our gear. Thanks everybody.